The hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Good morning. Welcome to the Environment Subcommittee's first hearing of the 116th Congress. This hearing is entitled Sea Change, Impacts of Climate Change on Our Oceans and Coasts. Building on the momentum of our first full committee hearing on the state of climate science, today we'll be discussing how climate change is impacting our oceans and coasts. This is an important topic, and I want to convey a few things as we begin. First, every American should care about changes to the oceans, even those who do not live along the coasts. Second, we are already seeing visible changes and paying a very real price. Climate change impacts are here happening now, not far off events for future generations to address. And those impacts can be seen in our oceans and coasts. According to NOAA, nearly half of Americans live along our 95,471 miles of coastline, which span three oceans, the Gulf of Mexico, the Great Lakes, and the Pacific and Caribbean islands. And more people are moving to the coasts each year. The fourth national climate assessment found that coastal zones employ 134 million people and contribute a staggering $16.7 trillion to our national gross domestic product. And for the other half of Americans who don't live on the coast, the oceans and coasts impact them directly and indirectly too, providing economic, recreational, and cultural opportunities. There's a lot to lose, not only for the environment, but for our thriving economy and communities by failing to address climate change impacts on our oceans and coasts. As science has established, climate change is real, it's happening, and it's caused primarily by human activity. NOAA just reported last month that 2018 was the fourth hottest year on record. Many people don't realize that global warming would be significantly worse without the buffering effects of the oceans. Oceans act like a big sponge soaking up much of the excess carbon dioxide and heat in the atmosphere. In fact, the International Union for Concern Conservation of Nature found that if the excess heat trapped by the oceans between 1955 and 2010 were released back into the lower atmosphere, the temperature would warm up nearly 97 degrees Fahrenheit. The oceans are protecting us from climate change's impacts by buffering against this increase in temperature, but this buffering is causing major changes to the oceans. Increased carbon emissions alter the oceans in three main ways, making them warmer, more acidic, and less oxygenated. These changes are occurring at unprecedented rates. For example, according to research published in the journal Science, the chemistry of the oceans is changing faster now than in the last 300 million years. Climate change has now claimed its first mammal in a way directly related to today's hearing. Just last week, the Australian government reported that the Bramble Key mosaic-tailed rat, a small rodent, was driven to extinction. Their island home became inundated with salt water from rising sea levels, causing their food and shelter to disappear. The threats of sea level rise, ocean warming, acidification, and deoxygenation are far-reaching, and many marine species face risk of extinction as these changes occur faster than most species can adapt. In Texas's 7th Congressional District, which I have the privilege to represent, we're seeing some of the earliest effects of coastal climate change, and we stand to face great risks as the fourth largest city and the biggest energy exporter in the United States. At just 50 feet above sea level, and is one of the flattest cities in America, Houston already experiences heavy rainfall, and our region faces the threat of storm surge, increasing the risk and the reality of flooding. Hurricane Harvey set the record for total rainfall from a tropical cyclone in the continental United States. Climate change is intensifying storms, making so-called 1,000-year storms like Harvey more frequent and causing sea levels to rise in Galveston Bay. According to the fourth Nas National Climate Assessment published in November, sea level rise along the Texas coast is twice as large as the global average. Experts are warning cities that cities like ours don't have that much time to adapt. That's why I'm glad we're here today to hear from our distinguished panel. I would like to welcome our witnesses this morning. Some of our scientific witnesses have been involved in writing 
in reviewing major climate, sa climate change reports, the National Climate Assessment and the IPCC Assessment Report, and are here to summarize some of the major findings on ocean and coastal changes. We will also hear from a representative of coastal industry whose experience on these issues is instructive for us all. I was encouraged in our first committee hearing to hear interest from members on both sides of the aisle toward developing solutions and technologies to address climate change. Adaptation and mitigation are very important. They're important parts of this conversation, and with today's hearing, we're laying the foundation for future discussions that will lead us to legislative solutions. The chair now recognizes Mr. Marshall for an opening statement. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Fletcher, for holding this hearing today to discuss a nuanced and significant issue. First of all, I want to congratulate you on your appointment to the chair of the Environment Subcommittee, and I look forward to working with you. In this committee, we may not always agree on everything, but I hope that we can agree on objectives and, and goals. Our objectives should be thoroughly, to be thoughtfully listened to the science and theories surrounding these topics. And our goal, at least in my opinion, should be to leave this environment of this country and the world better than we found it for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations so that we can all flourish. I was just reminded this past week, I, was, uh, I got to help my grandson catch his first fish uh, in the ocean. One of my loves is, is fishing and uh, tasting the outdoors, so it was great to, to be able to do that. But I have to be honest, the closest thing we have to oceans in the state of Kansas are amber waves of grain. So this is a unique opportunity for me to learn about the relationship between climate and the ocean. I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses today and hope we can find a way to talk constructively about these issues and more importantly about potential solutions. Oceans cover more than 70% of the earth and contain more than 90% of the life on our planet. Oceans, more specifically phytoplankton, produce most of the oxygen that we breathe and absorb most of the carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere, creating a cycle of oxygen and CO2. I have to tell you, I was giddy when I got to read some of your reports and go back to some of my biochemistry days. And uh, it just brought me back to my, my college days in so many ways and, and just really, really enjoyed the papers. I know congressmen aren't supposed to be excited about science, but I, I really am. Like plant and animal life on land, um, marine life and oceans themselves evolve. The chemistry and ecology change and life adapts. It's been happening for millions of years, but unfortunately, scientific evidence suggests that the pace of change, like the chairwoman said, has increased over the last century, adding more stress to our complex marine ecosystems. Some of this stress is the result of increased levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that are absorbed by the ocean. The result is a change in the chemistry of the oceans in which researchers have noted increased water temperature, lower pH levels, and decreased oxygen levels in certain areas. It's essential that we gain better understanding of ocean chemistry, effectiveness of potential solutions, and mitigation of negative impacts. For instance, some species are proving more resilient and adaptable to changing conditions. One of our goals should be to better understand this resiliency and find ways to translate this knowledge to broader ecosystem sustainability. One of, our, one of our witnesses, Dr. Tom Fraser, is the director of the University of Florida School of Natural Resources and Environment. He will go into detail in his research to help us all better understand the impacts and changes in aquatic ecosystems, as well as discuss some of the potential solutions to maximize environmental and economic value of our oceans. I believe advancing technology is the best path forward. As we speak, industry and governments around the world are examining carbon removal and garbage storage technology. There's some big ideas out there, from direct air capture to genetically modified phytoplankton and giant kelp farms, which I'm especially interested to hear about in the ocean that can absorb carbon dioxide. We learned during our hearings two weeks ago that moving entirely to renewables is not realistic or sustainable. So we must consider solutions like these that can help reduce or remove emissions generated around the globe. Researching, developing, and deploying these technologies will take a little time, but the payoff will be significant. Innovating our way to solutions has been a trademark of the American spirit since our country's inception. For example, in my practice as an obstetrician, I've seen how private innovation and response to market demand have done more to improve and drive down the cost of health care than any law or regulation written here in D.C. Just look at the evolution of medical imaging. 
40 years ago, MRI machines and CAT scanners were just hitting the market. But now we have high-resolution microscopic cameras that reduce the need for invasive surgeries and provide us a window into human health in ways that we never thought or I dreamed possible. Basic research, industry innovation, and thriving marketplace are what brought these technologies and others like it into our lives, not government regulation. We need to prioritize instruments that target the most impactful areas of research and provide specific steps for resiliency planning. America must lead the way and partner with industry to develop innovative technologies and solutions to the problems discussed here today. I thank our witnesses for being here today, and I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. The chair now recognizes the chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Johnson, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fletcher, and congratulations on your first subcommittee meeting. And let me say, too, let me welcome the witnesses, but also welcome to our former uh, subcommittee um, ranking member, Ms. Um, Bonamici, who has prepared legislation in this area. Uh, I'm pleased to join you this morning. Two weeks ago, we had our first climate change related hearing on the state of climate science and why it matters. That fruitful hearing was a broad overview of the myriad of ways climate change is affecting multiple aspects of the environment and our society. Today, we continue in that same vein and look specifically at the science and how the anthropogenic carbon emissions are affecting our oceans and coast. NOAA has found that almost 40% of the U.S. population lives in coastal counties. I'm not one of those. We have man-made lakes for drinking water where I live <laughs> in North Texas. Uh, but we do have a, a very large coastal area at the other end of the state. Uh, from the white sand beaches of Florida to the rocky shorelines of the Pacific Northwest, our coasts are not only iconic, popular tourist destinations, but also economic powerhouses of the nation. Coastal counties contribute $6.6 .6 trillion to our economy. Given the clear societal and economic importance of our oceans and coastal communities, it is imperative that we work to protect these resources. But our coastal communities are already seeing impacts of climate change. Ocean warming due to the anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions is responsible for, for rising sea levels, melting sea ice, and lower oxygen concentrations in our seawater. Warmer ocean temperatures also fuel stronger storms, which can lead to additional coastal damage from hurricanes. The findings from the fourth National Climate Assessment were very clear. Cutting our emissions of greenhouse gases will significantly and quickly help stave off the most severe potential impacts of climate change. Laying the foundation of the current state of science on our oceans and coasts in this hearing will help better understand what we can expect to see if we do not act to mitigate our carbon emissions now. During the first hearing, many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle were excited to discuss potential solutions to the climate challenges that many of us are starting to face uh, in our districts. However, in order to come up with robust solutions to the rapid changes we are seeing in our oceans and coastal communities, it is critical that we understand what is driving these changes. Successful mitigation and adaptation solutions will be based on robust science. I'm looking forward to having another productive hearing on climate change today, and I'm especially interested in receiving testimony from my ex expert scientific witnesses on how climate change is affecting sea level rise the physical and chemical processes within our oceans and the marine ecosystems. I am also glad to have a representative from the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association 
to speak about concrete evidence of climate change impacts on their livelihood and how they utilize science to develop solutions to this past pressing issue. The diverse perspectives provided by our witnesses will help guide the members of this committee as we work to develop bipartisan policy solutions to address climate change and ocean acidification based on sound science and ensure there's significant federal funding for climate research. I thank you, Madam Chair, and yield back. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Sarah Cooley, the Director of Ocean Acidification Program at the Ocean Conservancy. Dr. Cooley is an expert on the impacts of ocean climate change on human communities, and her research spans ocean climate and her research spans ocean carbon cycling, science communication, and science-based policy development. Dr. Cooley was a lead author on the second state of the carbon cycle report and a review editor on volume two of the fourth national climate assessment, both released last November. She's also a lead author on the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, which will be complete in 2021. Dr. Cooley received her PhD in marine science from the University of Georgia. Our second witness is Dr. Radley, Dr. Radley Horton, who is Lamont Associate Professor, Research Professor at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. His research focuses on climate extremes, sea level rise, tail risks, climate impacts, sea level rise, and adaptation. Dr. Horton was a convening lead author for the third national climate assessment. He currently co-chairs Columbia University's Climate Adaptation Initiative and is principal investigator for the NOAA Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Funded Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast. He received his PhD in Earth and Environmental Sciences from Columbia University. Our third witness is Dr. Thomas K. Frazier, who is professor and director of the School of Natural Resources and Environment at the University of Florida. His research examines water quantity and quality, nutrient dynamics, biogeochemical processes, fish population dynamics, food web interactions, and ecological restoration of degraded ecosystems. He's conducted field research in both freshwater and marine systems around the globe and is intimately familiar with environmental and resource challenges, including coral bleaching, ocean acidification, and sea level rise. He received his PhD in Biological Sciences from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Our final witness is Ms. Margaret Pilaro, who has served as the Executive Director of the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association, or PC PCSGA, since 2010. PCSGA represents over 100 shellfish companies who sustainably produce mussels, oysters, clams, and geoduck in the states of Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, and Hawaii. Prior to her current role, she worked for the Washington State Department of Natural Resources for 12 years and as a municipal planner in Rhode Island, where she dealt with storm and wastewater issues, restoring a fishery, and harbor management. Ms. Pilaro received an MA in Marine Affairs from the University of Rhode Island. Welcome to all of you. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you all have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. Thank you so much for being here. We'll begin this morning with Dr. Cooley. Thank you, Chairwoman, and good morning. My name is Dr. Sarah Cooley, and I'm a chemical oceanographer and director of the Ocean Acidification Program at Ocean Conservancy. I've studied the ocean carbon cycle for 18 years. I'm an expert on the impacts of ocean climate change on ecosystem services, a lead author on the second state of the carbon cycle report and the upcoming sixth assessment report of the IPCC, and I'm a review editor on the fourth national climate assessment. That report, mandated by Congress, offers three key ocean messages, which I'll explain in my testimony. First, the nation's ocean ecosystems are being disrupted by rising temperatures, acidification, 
deoxygenation, and other aspects of climate change, and this will worsen. Second, the nation's fisheries are at high risk from climate-driven changes. Third, extreme events due to climate are already harming important fisheries. Our ocean is experiencing unprecedented changes. Rising temperatures and absorption of greenhouse gases is impacting the ocean's ability to sustain human communities and modulate the Earth's climate. The ocean has absorbed 93% of the heat energy trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Despite this, our planet has still warmed by 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit since the turn of the last century. The ocean has also absorbed 22% of the atmospheric carbon dioxide released by human activity this decade. While this has slightly reduced the planetary warming that would have otherwise occurred, it's also changing the chemistry of the ocean. When carbon dioxide dissolves, it lowers seawater pH and alters chemical balances important for marine life. This is called ocean acidification. In the mid-2000s, widespread death of larval shellfish at hatcheries in Washington State and Oregon was definitively attributed to ocean acidification. We now know that ocean acidification causes many animals with hard shells and skeletons, like corals and shellfish, to grow more slowly and recover from damage less successfully. Some fishes and sharks become less able to find prey or avoid predators. Harmful algal blooms could become more frequent or toxic. Complex and hard to predict interactions occur among ocean acidification and other stressors, especially in the coastal zone. All of this can and already does impact human communities by disrupting fisheries, tourism, and more. Ocean heat absorption is also warming seawater and melting sea ice. This causes sea level rise, and it is changing ocean ecosystems and their benefits to people. Warmer ocean water holds less oxygen and allows less of the deep vertical mixing that normally moves oxygen into the ocean. Without enough oxygen in the ocean, ocean species will die. Warming oceans are driving our marine life north at about five miles a decade but American lobsters have shifted north at 43 miles per decade. Rapidly shifting fisheries are very hard to manage, and they strain fishing-dependent communities. Sea ice is melting, causing ice-dependent species to lose key habitat and Arctic waters to warm even more. Subsistence hunting will become dangerous and difficult, which threatens indigenous communities' food security and ways of life. Decreasing sea ice also allows more Arctic vessel traffic, bringing opportunities and risks. This committee can make a difference immediately by supporting science that focuses on solutions and how best to apply them, as well as continuing to support research that uncovers how the ocean human system works. The common theme in the research recommendations detailed in my written testimony is that we need to understand how to apply individual findings to ecosystem scales and how to use that knowledge in an equitable, well-planned approach that will reduce the stress from ocean climate change on marine ecosystems and the human communities they support. The fundamental solution to ocean climate change is to decrease emissions, particularly of carbon dioxide. That is a formidable global challenge. But the United States is the home of modern oceanography. After the World Wars, we unraveled the secrets of the deep oceans to gain a global military edge. In doing so, we have learned how our planet works. With this rich history, I have no doubt that the United States is up to the task of understanding and addressing climate change, the ocean challenge of today. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Thank you, Dr. Cooley. We'll now hear from Dr. Horton. Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, <clears throat> my name is Radley Horton. I'm a Lamont Associate Research Professor at Columbia University's Lamont Dougherty Earth Observatory. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this important hearing. I'm going to focus my remarks today on how the anthropogenic activities that we've heard about that have warmed the upper oceans are causing sea levels to rise. So there are two primary ways um, that global sea level rises as a result of that ocean warming. First and foremost, 
the upper oceans have warmed the surface of the ocean a degree Fahrenheit since 1900. That warming has made its way down to about 3,000 feet. That literally causes the ocean to stand taller. It's called thermal expansion. The second centrally important process globally is what's happening to land-based ice sitting in Greenland, Antarctica, um, and in high mountain glaciers. As the ocean warms, it's literally wearing away at the dams or buttresses, if you will, that are preventing that ice from sliding in part into the ocean. As more and more of that ice on land melts and makes its way into the water, we add mass to the ocean, causing further sea level rise. So we've seen about seven or eight inches of sea level rise globally uh, since 1900. Um, and there, importantly, there's been some acceleration over the past two decades or so. As we look to the future, projections of sea level rise for, say, 2100, we see a big range. We hear about a most likely range in the last national climate assessment of 1 to 4.3 feet. In my remarks, I'm going to take an optimistic approach and just focus on what one foot of sea level rise would mean. Uh, as I say, a very optimistic um, take on it. And really, you know, fundamentally, what I want to highlight is that even a little bit of sea level rise means much more frequent coastal flooding and much more intense and higher magnitude coastal flooding whenever you're having a storm. Um, and as we can see from figure one here, um, we're already seeing that nuisance or sunny day flooding is happening far more often than it used to across the US coastline. For many locations, a five or 10 fold increase just over the last two generations in how often we're seeing these high water levels from Miami, Miami to Norfolk, for example. These are events that flood people's basements, <clears throat> make it impossible for businesses to open uh, for normal operations, prevent people from being able to drive home along their normal coastal routes. When these events are rare, we can call them nuisances. But at, one po at what point, if they're happening more and more often, do they become something more than that, something that impacts real estate values, the ability to fund key infrastructure? Now let's go to slide two and focus as we look out to the future at what just one foot of sea level rise by 2100 could mean. What could it mean for the really extreme high water levels that currently happen once every 100 years along various parts of the US coast? These are the high water levels that determine insurance rates and zoning plans. And what we can see is across the whole US, events, high water levels that used to happen once per 100 years become things that you expect during the lifetime of the typical home mortgage. And in many places, every year or two, you could be seeing those high water levels occurring that used to happen once every 100 years. Again, this is with just one foot of sea level rise and no assumption about stronger storms. In reality, we expect a uh, balance of evidence suggests that the strongest hurricanes probably get stronger precisely because of ocean warming. That would make these effects worse than what you see here. It's not just more frequent coastal flooding, though. It's also higher magnitudes of flooding whenever a storm happens. One recent study found that if the New York region had been precisely the same when Hurricane Sandy struck, except somehow the oceans had been a foot lower as they were 100 years ago, 80,000 fewer people would have experienced flooding um, in their homes. That's the impact of just a little bit uh, of sea level rise. So this is also obviously a public health and safety issue. It means less time for people to evacuate around low-lying coastal areas. And for those unable to evacuate, it means greater risk of death, uh, more damage to buildings, because those water levels are higher, waves are able to penetrate uh, further inland. Along our assets uh, are trillions of dollars uh, worth, businesses, homes, hospitals, I-95, Amtrak, our airports. Um, but the economic impacts are going to make their way further inland as well. U.S. taxpayers bear the brunt of the bill for these coastal flood damages. And our coasts are economic hubs uh, for all activities. There are also national security implications that I hope we may have a chance uh, to discuss. Far inland from our coasts, extreme weather events are impacted by that warming of the ocean as well. We're loading the dice towards more heavy rain events and combinations of high heat and humidity that harm our most vulnerable populations and affect the economic productivity of our outdoor laborers um, as well. Um, I've had the good fortune to learn a great deal from decision makers as well as young people um, eager to tackle these problems uh, and learn more. For example, investors are demanding now that companies disclose their exposure to sea level rise. These experiences have convinced me that although we are fast running out of time, a window still remains open 
for the ultimate tipping point or surprise, specifically rapid societal action to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and prepare all of us uh, for these climate changes that are underway. Thank you for inviting me to testify and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Horton. We'll now hear from Dr. Frazier. Okay, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. So my testimony is a little longer than five minutes, so I think I'll cut right to the meat of it. Uh, my background is in marine ecology and fishery science, and I draw on my academic training and other professional experiences to provide here some examples of how and where investments in science would yield substantial value. Wild-caught fisheries yield approximately 90 million metric tons of fish and shellfish per year. However, this bountiful natural resource is already threatened with about one-third of global fish stocks classifies as overfished. And changing climate introduces new challenges. Among those challenges are changes in the ranges of exploited species, both expansions and contractions, and changes associated with alterations to habitats. As sea surface temperatures increase, war some warm water species can expand their ranges northward, but some colder water species will be forced to contract their ranges. As global climate changes, we will also see changes in habitats. These changes range from shifts in major ocean currents that will alter patterns in movement and recruitment to potential loss of inshore structural habitats such as seagrass meadows that provide food and shelter for a large number of exploited fishery species. In response to such challenges, managers will have to adapt their strategies with a key thrust being a commitment to ecosystem-based fishery management as proposed by NOAA Fisheries. For example, managers will need to be able to di differentiate between range expansions driven by increased stock abundances that result from effective management actions and range shifts driven by changes simply in water temperatures and ocean currents. Fisheries managers will also need to factor habitat and other environmental variables into stock assessments and stock projections because altered habitats appear to be inevitable consequence of climate change. Overall, managers will need to move from harvest quotas established primarily on the basis of historical landings to quotas that account for a changing or non-stationary environment. In addition, managers will need to consider ways to help and potentially even fund adaptation by the recreational and commercial fishing industry, such as moving access points and wholesale and retail outlets. Without such adaptations, we in the United States stand to lose a substantial portion of more than 1.7 million jobs, more than $212 billion in sales, and $100 billion in gross domestic product generated by these industries. Science comes into play because it is the best base for designing and implementing the necessary adaptations to existing management of our nation's fisheries. One way that science can help is by providing timely and accurate information on the status and trends of stocks and habitats. A second way that science can help is to transform the tools and techniques needed to mitigate undesirable changes in fish stocks or the habitats that support them. Given the time constraints imposed on this hearing, I will focus on one example of mitigating loss of habitat, rehabilitating coral reefs. Coral reefs occupy a relatively small proportion of the ocean realm, but harbor more than 25% of marine biodiversity. Coral reefs also support important recreational, commercial, and subsistence fisheries around the globe. In fact, coral reefs yield approximately 25% of the total fish catch in developing nations and contribute to substanti substantially to the economies of more than 100 countries that promote reef-related tourism, including our own. They are, however, one of the most imperiled habitats on the planet due to nutrient pollution, physical damage, overfishing, and other local stresses. Global climate change only exacerbates this problem. Managers must continue to address local stresses and as already indicated, we need to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases to address global stresses. Regardless of our efforts, nearly all coral reefs will be threatened by conditions generated from existing levels of climate change by the year 2050. In fact, managers should prepare to mitigate both existing damage and the damage that will occur from the inevitable changes in global climate that have already been initiated. Rehabilitating or restoring damaged and degraded reefs will require transformational innovations and advancements based on sound science. Key questions to be addressed are included in my written testimony. Answering those questions and transferring the new knowledge into effective and efficient innovations and advancements will take time and a consistent stream of resources. In fact, it is an investment that we should begin now. In conclusion, I reiterate my agreement with much of what you have heard from others. Climate change poses significant threats and now is the time to begin addressing the human activities that drive it. My goal today was to introduce a potentially new topic, 
the need for consistent investment in science that will support incremental adaptation to the effects of climate change and build the basis for transformational change in mitigating existing and future effects. My hope is that this initial contribution might persuade you and the committee members to include discussion of the risk and rewards associated with long-term investments in science in your future deliberations. I will close by saying that I'm happy to participate in those discussions. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. We'll now hear from Ms. Pilaro. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for having me here today. Um, um, I am, as the director of the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association, I am extremely proud to represent some of the hardest working women and men on the West Coast. Shellfish farming, which employs thousands of people in rural economies in the West, on the West Coast, depend on the tides. With the most rigorous work occurring at low tide, which half the year falls during the winter months. And as such, as Mother Nature would have it, a cruel joke, half of that time falls during the middle of the night. There is both significant amount of pride and responsibility among shellfish growers because most of the members of, of my organization are second, third, and fourth generation farmers all of which depend upon healthy environment to farm and therefore are avid protectors of coastal and marine ecosystems. Shellfish farming began commercially in the mid to late 1900s, and, and we know that oysters fueled the California gold rush. In the 1920s, the native oyster populations along the west coast became depleted from overharvesting, but also due to poor water quality. And this was one of the first periods of adaptation that growers faced. The shellfish industry turned west to Japan and brought over the Pacific oyster, which naturalized well. However, in part because of natural reproduction of that oyster was not robust enough to support the growing demand, the industry in the 1970s adapted to hatchery production for larvae and seed, or baby oysters. The largest of these hatcheries at the time was Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery in Neatarts Bay, Oregon. It's a family-run business to this day which at that time supplied over 70% of the West Coast farms with seed. The predictability of hatchery seed allowed the industry to flourish well beyond Oregon and Washington and now to California, Alaska, and Hawaii, and beyond oysters to now clams, mussels, and a large, coast, a large West Coast burring clam called the gooey duck. In 2007, Whiskey Creek stumbled upon the next chapter in shellfish farming's path on, of adapting, when the hatchery witnessed a 70 to 80 percent mortality of the, of the larvae. They immediately tried to determine the cause, looking to natural bacteria and disease, but in consultation with researchers at the University of Washington, understood that the issues related to acidic water, or low pH, and carbonate concentration. Buffering the water at Whis Whiskey Creek Hatchery and a second hatchery experiencing the same fate has been a, a solid fix, although somewhat temporarily. The longer term adaptation needs to be considered and is necessary, especially since ocean oceanographers tell us that this change in pH is due to older water, which has been absorbing the Earth's carbon emissions for a century, and that even stopping the carbon emission, uh, in, carbon emission inputs today would mean 30 to 50 years of acidic waters and issues not just for oysters, but for all marine organisms. During the past 10 years, we are beginning to learn that other climate-related changes impact the growth and health of shellfish beyond the hatchery and onto the beaches of farms. We are experiencing hypoxic periods, increasing temperatures, a decrease in available food in the water column, an increase of disease and harmful algal blooms, changes in growth patterns for the shellfish, such as yield, size, and the way in which they grow generally. We're noticing that mussels are, are affected as well with uh, their abyssal threads. We're seeing a de decrease in resistance to predators, such as oysters oyster drills, and the intensity and frequency of storm events are all things in which the industry must adapt. Real-time oceanographic da data collected by the Integrated Oceanographic Observing System, or IUS, 
plus the guidance of NOAA's ocean acidification program have been essential to the industry. And it's just been used to consult, it's used to being consulting tide books and looking at, now are looking at, at tidal, salinity, and carbonate data on their phones directly on the beach in, these, in order to direct their activities. The industry on both coasts take advantage of discussions at local universities, nonprofits, and governments in finding ways to help. We need more. We need to better understand the interactions of shellfish and other organisms, such as kelp and grasses. We need to look into genetics and see if families are better suited for to survive these changes, much like we've done in the, in the wheat and grain industry. We need to understand how rising sea levels will impact where and how shellfish will grow. We're in exciting times of technology, and shellfish farmers are, are not easily discouraged, because if they were, they wouldn't get out of bed each morning. But we need help and policies and leadership to allow the tradition of shellfish and the families that have been farming shellfish for generations to continue long into the future. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Thank you, Ms. Pilaro. At this point, we will begin our first round of questions, um, and the chair recognizes herself for five minutes. Um, so I want to ask a general question to everyone on the panel. Um, it seems that, to us that the, the scientific consensus that we've heard in this uh, hearing this morning and in our full committee hearing um, is, is pretty solid, but on the on the state of the oceans, it seems like there are major challenges to being able to understand um, because of the, the breadth and the scope of the research left to do. Um, there have been some major advances in our understanding of how carbon emissions impact the oceans and coasts through ocean warming, acidification, deoxygenation. Um, but I think there's still a lot that we understand is unexplored, um, inaccessible, and expensive to study. So my question, if each of you could... Um, share with us your thoughts on what the biggest challenges to studying these changes are and what are the ways that the federal government can help in, in exploring these and addressing the challenges that you experience in your research. Um, I, would, I would say that um, one of the biggest challenges is the ocean is vast. And as you note, it's very difficult to be everywhere and understand all the processes. Um, there have been substantial advances in the last decades on remote observing systems where autonomous uh, devices can go out through the ocean and measure um, different variables and then uh, send back the data to uh, researchers on land. Um, that's only one piece of it, though. We have satellites that can help as well with that same type of work. However, bringing that information together and making sure that there's no drift in the instruments still requires some individuals to be out there sampling. So I think um, a, an integrated viewpoint of how to uh, inquire what is happening in the ocean is important to keep in mind. Um, you know, no one is more excited than oceanographers about cool devices that go through the ocean. But um, we realize that there, is, there needs to be sort of a network to bring that information together and put it to work. Another piece I might highlight is the modeling component, um, greater resources and, and supercomputing that leverages some of those observations and helps us understand processes at various scales in the ocean. But also, as we think about some of the tail risks that I didn't have a chance to talk about, why we might get more than a foot of sea level rise, for example, to really understand those risks, we have to understand the interaction of things like changes in ocean currents mm -hmm. with loss of Arctic sea ice. What might that indirectly mean for the Greenland ice sheet, for example? And how could changes in that ice sheet feed back on ocean circulation? Those are where we start to see the uncertainties. And the further we push greenhouse gas concentrations, the bigger the risk of unpleasant surprises. So we need models to help us understand those, those risks more fully. Thanks. Uh, I would agree with what I just heard, right? Data are key. And there are certainly uh, observing systems that are becoming better and better all the time. I think we need to continue to improve on those and, and develop the technologies that will allow them to advance further. Um, again, I come from a fisheries background, right? And, and data in that regard, real-time data collection, 
um, or near real-time data collection is, is super, super important. Right now, we assess stocks based on data that might have been collected five years ago, but things are changing much faster than that, and so we need to probably uh, incorporate a more regular sampling of fishes, right, to, to get the data that we need to make good assessments to inform um, the industries what they can do. And I would agree also that modeling is key, right? Modeling integrates all of that information and helps us to make predictions so that we can adapt uh, in a timely manner. Thank you. Well, I will agree with everything else that the panel has, has said. I will emphasize the relationship between species is important. How does shellfish inter, um, relate to other organisms in the, in the ocean? Um, funding is, is harsh. <laughs> That's, uh, there's a lot of competition for, for a little bit of funds. Um, and getting the, the data, the information, the output from models, all of what was mentioned into the hands of someone who really can use it, like the shellfish growers, is beneficial because A, they're using it, and B, it brings more attention to it, uh, to its applicability, which then hopefully will reinforce the, the need and the acceptance of funding for these kinds of things. Thank you all. I yield back the remainder of my time, and I now recognize Mr. Marshall for five minutes. All right. Thank you, Chairwoman. I'm going to ask you all about innovation. I want you to think about what's out there, the greatest, latest. Don't be afraid if it's a crazy idea. Think outside the box. What's going on in the, in the world that's innovative? I'm particularly interested in phytoplankton farming or kelp farming. I think about you know, the, the, the uh, shellfish industry, maybe we should be trying to grow more kelp than worried about the genetic editing of oysters or something like that. So maybe, Ms. Player, we'll start with you and go backwards, maybe take 30 seconds. What's out there that's great and late in innovation? Um, well, I agree with you that there is some really great innovation in kelp farming, and the relationship between kelp and, and shellfish is, is fabulous. It's be. difficult to permit, however, so when we talk about policies, this is something that we'll need to talk a little bit more about. I think also to, talk, to make a connection with your amber waves of grain, I think there's a lot of fabulous work that's been done in the in genetics uh, for, for wheat and grain that we need to also apply to uh, shellfish and see what we can be doing there. It's a very new concept, but uh, it's great to understand how uh, genetically organisms can be um, not modified, but you finding families that are better, more resistant to some of these challenges. Great. If you can get to us, uh, your what you need. You mentioned some type of some processes or. Um, that, that would help you to do more of the kelp farming, let us know. And uh, by the way, I think the Department of Agriculture would do a great job overseeing the gene editing compared to the FDA, just an aside. Dr. Fraser, you're up. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I, I would agree as well. I think that there are certainly molecular advances that we can employ to help identify um, more resilient strains of particular organisms and to focus on uh, perhaps using those in mitigation efforts. Um, I'm interested in your phytoplankton and, and kelp question. I agree with you uh, there that phytoplankton and, and kelp take up and assimilate a, a large amount of CO2, um, and so do other things such as seagrass beds. And I think what we should try to do uh, is safeguard those habitats so that they can continue to perform like they're supposed to. The issue of actually trying to increase their abundance or, or grow them um, I think we, we do face some challenges right now with regard to scalability, and that's something that- Are people doing it? Are people researching it? Is University of Florida leading the charge? Who's leading the charge on it? I think there's universities, or, or certainly the University of Florida is doing some of that, and other universities around the nation are trying to invest to figure out how to uh, increase the capabilities of, of autotrophs, phytoplankton, and, and other organisms to grow, okay. right, and, and sequester right. that carbon. Thanks, yeah, Dr. Horton. Yeah, I like how your, your question about innovation references both the potential for greenhouse gas mitigation, measures that could take carbon out of the atmosphere, but also adaptation and, and, and resilience. I think we, we really do need both. By reducing emissions, we can buy ourselves time for some of these technologies um, to come into play with the right kind of investments, as you say. I guess one other quick thing to highlight within the adaptation space is, again, from a modeling perspective, can we test out some of these solutions, things like storm surge barriers, dredging so we can better understand costs and benefits associated with those activities. 
There might be an obvious benefit of pre preventing a storm surge, but what could be some of the potential downsides? And some of that gets into the social science of sort of moral hazard. What if a barrier fails? Um, I think there's a, a whole bunch of social science questions involving those living at the coast, how they perceive some of these emerging hazards, potential changes in real estate value that are maybe sort of outside the realm uh, of the science component, but, but deep social science questions that we're engaging with communities in as they sort of lead the charge in thinking about uh, these resilience issues. Thanks, yeah, Dr. Cooley. Um, I think it's a great question. Innovation is so important, uh, but technology and devices is just one piece. So the other piece is innovation and decision making and how we put that information to work. Um, you mentioned that your work in healthcare, you've gotten a great front seat to what innovation has done. Um, what we see there is that new devices have given more information for better patient care and better collective decision making. We're learning a lot more about how to do that in the ocean environment. Um, the example that um, Ms. Polaro outlined in the West Coast has been a great example of how better technology for shellfish growers has led to a better regional outcome. And I think we need to take the best lessons from that and learn how to apply it to the ocean common resources that we want to care about. All right. I'm there. I'm going to go over my time here, so I better yield back since it's a new chairwoman in charge here. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. I'll now recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher and Ranking Member Marshall, and thank you to our witnesses. I've been looking forward to this hearing, and I'm really glad, uh, Mr. Marshall, to hear you're excited about science, and this is an important issue even for our colleagues and constituents who do not represent coastal areas, because as we've heard this morning, and we know, the health of our oceans reflects the health of our planet. Oregon's economic vitality is dependent on the health of the Pacific Ocean and the lower Columbia River estuary. We're very vulnerable to the effects of climate change, especially ocean and coastal acidification. As co-chair of the House Oceans Caucus, I know that the health of our natural resources and marine resources is critical, and I'm advocating for investments in research to predict and adapt to these challenges. I recently reintroduced the Bipartisan Coastal and Ocean Acidification Stressors and Threats, or Coast Research Act, with Representative Young, uh, also the, the other co-chair of the Oceans Caucus, Representative Pingree and Representative Posey, to expand the scientific research and monitoring to improve our understanding of ocean and coastal acidification. The bill would improve research on ocean and coastal acidification in the context of environmental stressors, assess adaptation and mitigation strategies, and designate NOAA as the lead federal agency responsible for implementing the federal response. Additionally, the bill would increase our understanding of the socioeconomic effects of ocean acidification and coastal acidification in estuaries. It would engage stakeholders, including the commercial fishing industry, researchers, and community leaders through an advisory board, and provide for the long-term stewardship and standardization of data on ocean acidification from different sources, including the National Centers for Environmental Information and the Integrated Ocean Observing System. These efforts will help identify risks and inform vulnerable communities, industries, and coastal and ocean managers on how they can best prepare and when possible adapt to changing conditions. Dr. Cooley, I appreciate in your written testimony you discuss some of the research gaps. Thank you for that. You also discuss how the fundamental solution to ocean warming, acidification, and oxygen loss is to decrease greenhouse gas emissions emphasizing the connection between ocean acidification and greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we heard that from everybody on the panel today. How do you, Dr. Cooley, how do human-caused greenhouse gas emissions change seasonal upwelling when the winds cause nutrient-rich deeper water to rise from below, especially on the Pacific coast? Thank you for that question, Congresswoman, and thank you for your leadership on introducing the Coast Act. Um, the um, the action of, uh, of atmospheric warming tends to um, change or enhance upwelling uh, favorable winds. Um, winds that come from a certain direction along a coastline will drive upwelling naturally, and that can be enhanced um, when those winds become stronger. And that um, 
allows uh, deeper waters to move up along the coast and um, reach coastal resources and fisheries decades sooner than they would be expected to. So in the, in, in the Pacific Northwest, um, as Ms. Polaro highlighted, um, shellfish growers were experiencing waters that upwelled 50 to 100 years earlier than, ex yeah. than expected, and they were carrying um, water that um, that had an extra enhanced amount of carbon dioxide in it from being exposed to the atmosphere this century. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to want to get two more questions in. Um, Dr. Cooley and Dr. Horton, how can Congress best support adaptation and mitigation strategies to address these socioeconomic effects? And if you could answer briefly, because I really want to get in a question from Ms. Polaro. I think, I think probably the, um, the most important piece is to support structures that involve multiple stakeholders and set a collective vision. Great. Dr. Horton. I would agree with that. Um, vulnerable communities, just to give one example, um, when we think about the combination of high temperature and high humidity, that's going to affect the elderly, those with pre-existing health conditions. It's not one size fits all. We need science to help us understand how different communities differ in their vulnerability and in the adaptation strategies that make the most sense for them, because ultimately these are about long-term decisions that are good for all of Thank society. You. Uh, and Ms. Polaro at Oregon State University, uh, Dr. Burke Hales developed a Percolator, a device the size of a piece of carry-on luggage that can analyze when the shellfish growers across the Pacific Northwest should grow larvae based on the acidity and effects of calcium carbonates needed for the shell formation. As you discuss in your uh, testimony, the shellfish hatcheries, especially Whiskey Creek shellfish in my home state of Oregon, have been on the front lines of responding. Why are federal investments in tools like the Percolator and the data from the Integrated Ocean Observing System necessary for our fishers? and the shellfish industry? It's critically necessary because some of these impacts are happening regardless of where shellfish farming happens and where hatcheries are. So it's not, it's not bound by a state, it's not bound by a region. And so having that federal commitment and, and, and input is, is vitally important. We don't want to be in a situation where a private entity builds something and then um, has it to themselves and keeps it. Uh, it would be helpful to have something that that all of the folks who are interested in 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 harvesting from the sea, whether it's kelp or shellfish or anything else, any other uh, fisheries resource, can gain access to that information and that Thank you. technology. Thank you. And uh, Chair Fletcher, I apologize for going over time, but as I yield back, I request unanimous consent to add several letters from ocean stakeholder groups in the record in support of the Coast Research Act. <coughs> Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield. And I will now recognize my colleague from Texas, Mr. Babin, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. And thank you, witnesses, for being here as well. Uh, Dr. Harton, uh, many of the Green New Deal proponents have, are suggesting that greenhouse gas emissions are at a catastrophic level, some of which are claiming that we have 12 years left. Uh, do we have 12 years, in your opinion? Just keep it as brief as you can, if you don't mind. I've got some other questions, too. You need to turn on your, turn on your microphone. The further we turn up the dial on greenhouse gas emissions, the greater the risk of potential surprises that are very hard to predict. So it's, it's, uh, we're, we're getting close to that point then, in other, in other words. And also, do you think it's responsible for some of our nation's leaders and the media to suggest that certain doom will arrive unless we adopt uh, the new Green Deal policies? I can't speak to the specifics of Green New Deal policies. What I can say is that to the extent that it represents an appreciation of the urgent need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, I agree that's something that, that, that we really do need to do given the, given the hazards I described in my testimony. Okay, thank you. Uh, because some of these policies may cost some jobs uh, and some of the costs that we've heard have been, been stunning. And Dr. Cooley, uh, do you think that the new Green Deal should be passed into law? 
Well, I'm not here to talk about the Green New Deal, but what is new? Do you think it's a good idea that we that that, that it's been put forward? Uh, the Green New Deal has started a conversation about details, which we haven't had before. Um, we're having dis discussions across the aisle about the future we want and the specific ways we can get there. And that is incredibly inspiring um, as a scientist who's interested in details and solutions. How do we get from here to there? Okay. That's a really tough question. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Frazier, uh, what are some of the solutions that you think will aggressively target climate change that might not hurt American families or the economy because some of the proponents of the New Green Deal have put forward these uh, provisions that would absolutely hurt uh, my district 36 in Texas and much of the economy. Give me some, uh, some ideas that you have uh, of what might be some of these solutions that wouldn't be so hurtful uh, because of uh, the, my constituents' uh, concerns for my constituents. Well, as I said in, in my testimony, I think that there are lots of um, vulnerable habitats out there, for example, that are affected by a large number of stressors. Um, and if we could make sure that we manage and maintain those habitats, they would um, continue to play a role in uh, ameliorating some of the risk associated with climate change, but not entirely. So I would pay attention on proper management of the habitat so they don't continue to degrade. Seagrasses would be one of those, kelp habitats, and, and others. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, and uh, let's see, Dr. Frazier, one more. Uh, if the United States does implement the New Green Deal, how would we keep American jobs here well, in your opinion, would costs rise as much as some of these? I mean, we, we've, we've looked at $93 trillion of costs uh, to the American taxpayer. In your opinion, would that is that true? Do, uh, we've seen time and again that green companies uh, take their production overseas for cheaper costs and production. So how do we address this? You know, when the American taxpayer is expected to foot the bill for some of the biggest polluters in the world, uh, China being one of them, uh, it doesn't seem fair. What What is your opinion there? What What are your thoughts? So again, I, what I would say is that what we've heard today is that there's an investment that needs to happen with regard to data collection, and it's all kind of data collection from innovation and technologies, modeling, and, and real-time data collection. With regard to the area that I'm mostly involved in, fisheries, that increased data collection actually increases the certainty by which we can uh, estimate the stocks that we can access. And by increasing that certainty, we can actually exploit more fishes, and that uh, actually ends up being an economic benefit. So sometimes in order to make money, you have to, to pay money, sure. right? Yeah. And so I think what we should be thinking about is making wise investments and getting good return on those investments. Do you think the New Green Deal is a good thing that should be passed in the law? I, I'm not gonna speak specifically to the New Green Deal because I, don't, I haven't read it. I apologize. Okay. All right. Well, Madam Chair, I think that finishes me up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Babin. I'll now recognize Mr. Christ for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Marshall, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's special report that came out last year states that coral reefs are projected to decline by an additional 70 to 90 percent uh, with an increase in global temperatures of 1.5 degrees Celsius. A 99% loss would be experienced uh, with an increase of 2 degrees Celsius. Florida, where I live, uh, which is home to the fourth largest barrier reef in the world, the Florida Keys Reef System, is already experiencing an unprecedented coral disease outbreak. Uh, Dr. Cooley, uh, can you discuss in more detail how global temperatures uh, increases to impact our coral reefs and what this means for places like Florida that rely on these oceans and coastal resources. Thank you for that question. Um, coral reefs are extremely <coughs> sensitive to temperature 
And when they receive a too much of a heat wave effect or too much intense heating in a short period of time, they will lose the cells that live inside the corals that help them produce food. And so the corals are, are without resources at that point. That's a coral bleaching event. That can quickly lead to coral death. And at the same time, acidification is sort of uh, decreasing the ability of those corals to recover because it's decreasing the net growth rate of corals. So when corals uh, experience bleaching or breakage, they're less able to recover. And that really is a one-two punch. It's very, very serious for corals. Thank you. Uh, my next question is addressed to all of the panelists. Um, what can we do to preserve our coral reef systems overall? Whoever wants to go first. I'm happy to field that one for sure. I mean, there's a, a tremendous amount of local pressures on coral reefs, right? There's a eutrophication that's a consequence of increased nutrient delivery. There's physical damage, again, due to anchoring and, and other activities. There's sedimentation due to uh, coastal development. Uh, all of those types of things contribute to the degradation of coral reefs, and they make them more vulnerable, obviously, to the stresses that are associated with an increasing warming temperature. So I think you need to pay attention to both the local stressors and uh, certainly continue to increase the greenhouse gas emissions problem. Anyone else? I would just add, I'm not a scientist, but one of the things that's important in a situation like this in coral reef um, reduction is education and communication and sharing that information with a wide variety of people. Um, to a certain extent, it affects everybody and you need to find the right message, the right way to tell that story to as broad a population as possible. Great. Yes, sir. So maybe this is a window to talk a little <laughs> bit about correlation across different mm -hmm. types of extreme events, these sort of compounding factors. So for those reefs, if we're seeing even just a little bit of an increase in rainfall and more runoff as a result, and if we're seeing just a little bit stronger storms um, as those ocean warms, once, once we couple that with sea level rise, you see nonlinear combinations now where suddenly there's a lot more standing water, a lot more runoff, and maybe some unpredictable um, effects on coral reefs related to that sort of linking of the global uh, and, and more local scales. So those are, those are the kind of hazards we need to understand better and we need science to do so. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Frazier, as a fellow Floridian, um, I know that you're extremely familiar with the red tide outbreak that uh, Florida suffered this past year. Uh, one thing that struck me about the outbreak was the lack of information as to why he was so severe this past year. Do you have any suggestions to that? Um, again, I, I'm super familiar with that as well. And, uh, and one of the things that we don't understand about red tides is why they actually um, establish themselves, right? And it gets to this issue that we talked about earlier about data acquisition, right? And we need to make sure that we have the uh, data collection systems in place so that we're not behind the eight ball in this particular case. So um, that's my answer. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. You yield back. Thank you, Mr. Christ. I now recognize Mr. Gonzalez for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Marshall uh, for holding the hearing today. also want to thank the witnesses for being here. I know uh, it takes a lot of prep and, and can be stressful, so I, I appreciate your participation. Uh, so I, I do believe climate change is real and global industrial development has been a contributing factor. Uh, but I also believe that the proposals that we've seen in the Green New Deal, uh, quite frankly, would devastate my community. Um, I'm from Northeast Ohio. Uh, think steel country, a lot of manufacturing, uh, a lot of agriculture, uh, these kind of energy intensive businesses, if you will. Uh, and, and the proposals being presented would raise our energy costs to such a level that I can't help but think that uh, our citizens, my constituents, would be making trade-offs between things like fueling up their car uh, or putting food on the table. Uh, and I think that is just fundamentally unsustainable. Uh, that, that makes no sense. Um, but again, uh, problem's real. Uh, and, and I'm committed to finding a, a broad basket of market solutions uh, to tackle the challenges of the present and future. Uh, what I believe is, is that we need to focus on technologies that are going to make consumers and, and industry essentially neutral when it comes to uh, the energy source. And the only way we can do that is by making our energy sources affordable and reliable. Uh, we, we ignore the reliability part, but um, 
too often, but, but the Green New Deal and all those proposals um, kind of ignore it, and, and I think that's wrong. So I, I believe we need to focus on technology solutions that we can export abroad that are going to make energy cheap uh, and reliable, bottom line. Um, and so uh, I represent, as I mentioned, uh, a non-coastal district uh, located in northeast Ohio. Uh, we don't have an ocean reef or, or coastal beaches. Um, so my first question or, will go to Dr. Frazier uh, or anyone on the panel. Um, but you know, when I'm educating my constituents uh, on why uh, this, this challenge, specifically the one we're here to address today, uh, affects them, what, you know, what would you say um, for somebody from, from my district? Well, I'm again going to speak about fisheries, right? And yep. there's a people tend to think of fisheries as being a coastal resource, but those uh, fisheries products are uh, serve the nation in its entirety, right? There's a supply chain there. There's businesses, uh, retailers, wholesalers, restaurants, and I'm pretty sure that in Ohio, people eat lots of seafood. And so, um, again, it's something that's it's not just. Um, a natural resource issue, you know, right? It's a food security issue as well, right? So that's why you should care. We have the best walleye in the world, by the way. Yeah, excellent. Um, but uh, so again, again, Dr. Frazier, yeah, we have Lake Erie. Um, so again, Dr. Frazier, you discuss the importance of long-term investment in science and state good science can take a while to come to fruition. Um, and, and again, that's kind of where I, I think we need to be headed is technological innovation, uh, that's that's going to bring costs down and reliability up. Um, in this instance, how do you suggest we as Congress differentiate between good science and bad science, uh, and how do we make sure the science is, is robust enough? I think that um, Congress, um, let, me, let me step back a minute. I'd say that we have organizations in the United States, the National Science Foundation, for example, and NOAA, that are in the business of evaluating science in a peer review process. I think you would, should depend on that. Um, the priorities can be established elsewhere, and they certainly involve trade-offs. And, and, um, and I think that's something that's best in the hands of the policymakers. Okay. Um, and then where, and this is for anybody, if anybody wants to jump in, um, where are we seeing the most promise uh, from a technological standpoint? Where's the research saying, hey, you know, if, if we could double down on this set of activities, uh, I think we could really make some headway. A anybody feel free. Um, w one way in which I think, and I spoke to it earlier um, in Mr. Marshall's question, was, is in, in looking at um, how animals respond and what traits they carry that um, can be more resistant to some of the stressors that they are experiencing. As things are changing, uh, we need to better understand um, that that element of, of of the animals and what interactions that they have, and and perhaps growing shellfish with eelgrass is, is something that's been happening for a long time and is a symbiotic relationship for both of those, those species. Um, but as, as I mentioned earlier, cattle and grain, they've, they've looked at how animals um, can, can, using that, those, those families and the genetic makeup that exists within those, those animals, how, how it can further them along. And shellfish is fairly new. Um, and other fisheries are fairly new in, in that regard and, and could benefit greatly from that. And the Animal Research Service under the USDA is the f most appropriate and would be a fabulous place to invest some, some Great. funds. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize Mr. Kasten for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair, Chairwoman. Um, the, I'd like to ask some questions of Dr. Horton, and I want to follow on, you, you described in your testimony a delay between CO2 emissions and sea level rise, and given how rapidly we are, on an unprecedented basis, we're increasing CO2, you can appreciate that that makes me a little nervous. How far back in the geologic record do you have to go to find CO2, atmospheric CO2 levels of where they are right now? Literally millions of years. And if you look back in that time, do you have any sense of what the temperature was then relative to what it is now? Well, 
our, our understanding is that, you know, as we look back at sort of the deep paleoclimate, and especially times when, when the planet was a little bit warmer, it appear, a couple things appear clear. One, sensitivity, temperature sensitivity to CO2 appears to be higher than it might seem if we just looked at the climate models of today. Um, and furthermore, sea level rise sensitivity over long time scales appears to be very sensitive to even say one degree um, of global warming. So I think consistent with your point, when we look at deeper history, we can find times when it was a degree or two warmer maybe, sea levels were tens of feet uh, higher um, in some cases. And likewise, when it was a little bit colder, times when sea level was far lower, not a little lower. So that suggests some of these kinds of powerful positive feedbacks. So, so if we were to look at the, you know, the empirical data that we have and, and recognizing that the climate models get better and better but are still models, okay. the, what is a reasonable assumption to make about where we might equilibrate on an empirical basis at current CO2 levels with respect to both temperature and sea levels? So, so I guess, um, to, to be clear, but equilibration, we mean over the long time scale, multi-centuries, maybe even out to a, th a thousand years potentially. Those numbers, I think, are, are disturbingly, disturbingly high. Um, I mean, one key question is, what carbon dioxide levels, concentrations, would we assume as, as the equilibration? I mean, even if we could somehow turn off greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, not reduce emissions, but, but turn them off, we'd still be stuck with greenhouse gas concentrations close to the levels they're at now for decades uh, to centuries. So even without future emissions, you know, as we're starting to get out into multiple centuries out, you see continued large amounts um, of sea level rise. But of course, we need to not have those greenhouse gas emissions so that we avert the risk of some of these tail responses, rapid changes in the ice sheet. So, but we don't know exactly where those thresholds are. So when you talk about being having you know, a potential risk of eight feet of sea level rise, mm -hmm. it, it, am I understanding you correctly to say that it actually could be higher than that if, we, if, if we're sitting at current sea levels and saying, if we look at the historical record, where, where were those sea levels in prior periods? Depends on the time scale. In, in my personal opinion, a sort of worst case scenario for the year 2100 might be about eight feet. I can't say if it's a low, little lower or a little higher. That is not the most likely outcome. That's a low probability, but extremely high consequence outcome should it happen um, for, for society. Um, so my personal opinion, and also the opinion of the last National Climate Assessment, is that eight feet by 2100 is about um, the worst case scenario with big uncertainties on both sides. There's much less uncertainty in that sort of lower end one foot level that I highlighted and showed how even that would have such a big impact on coastal flooding. And does the eight feet assume that we actually take meaningful efforts to slow CO2 now, or does that assume a business case as usual? For the most part, it assumes continued greenhouse gas emissions um, at, at a relatively high level. RCP 8.5 scenario, if you're familiar with that, high greenhouse gas emissions. But especially as those concentrations get up higher and higher, uh, we run the wit risk that the ice sheets could, could give up a lot of ice, even if we then were, were to reduce our emissions. But for the most part, those eight foot type scenarios do assume continued high increases in greenhouse gases. Okay, my final question then, and, and Dr. Cooley, you may have some thoughts on this as well. I'm, I'm leaving this hearing to go question Jerome Powell um, about our, among other things, our housing policy. Talk to me about what housing in the United States looks like over the realm of 30 year mortgages in a world with three to eight foot level seat sea level rise. So talk about sort of unanswerable questions, but I think the key point I'd say there is, is it really safe to assume that property values don't start to drop before the water arrives? You know, if people are sort of waiting on this assumption that we have enough time till the water actually gets there, given what we've been talking about, how we're sort of locked into additional sea level rise, you know, that, that's an assumption that could be questioned. I think, you know, I can't tell you exactly when, but towards your point, I think there are a lot of assets uh, potentially at risk, whether it's homes, whether it's the ability to fund, underwrite certain types of infrastructure. And if people start to move away from some of these communities, who gets left behind? What happens to the tax bases there? Off? We're really opening Pandora's box um, the further we, we green, increase greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. The chair will now recognize Mr. Weber for five minutes. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Dr. Fraser, South Texas <coughs> has some of the best fishing uh, in the world. <coughs> Pardon me. I was listening to your uh, discussion with Dr. Babin, and you talked about getting more data to exploit more fishes. I thought that was an interesting choice of words, exploit. How about enjoy? Would that be better? <clears throat> Either one would work. Okay. Well, I'd like to request unanimous consent to change that word in the record. I'm not. It, just want to make sure that we have a lot of good fishing and, and that we do enjoy those and we do protect those fisheries. Can I explain that further? Would that be all right? I'm, I'm dying to hear. Okay. So what happens is when, when we do a stock assessment, there's some uncertainty surrounding that assessment. And increased data collection allows us to increase the certainty, right? And when we increase the certainty, it's possible that we can uh, adjust the quotas such that you can actually harvest or enjoy more fish. And so it, it's, a, it's a case where increased data collection or an investment yields a positive economic benefit. I get it. That's that's the most egregious word you could use to encourage that data collection. We're all we're all adults here, uh, and that's fine. Um, but I have a question for all the witnesses. I'm from the Gulf Coast of Texas. Uh, Galveston and Freeport, Texas, are both cities in my district with economic ties to shipping industries. The ports located there are important to both our local and national economy. We move 95% of the nation's LNG. We produce 65% of the nation's jet fuel, 20% uh, of the nation's gasoline east of the Rockies, and that includes the Port of Houston. So we're a huge energy district. Now, some of my colleagues, like my, the gentleman to my right, Mr. Posey, Posey in Florida, face a different challenge um, in adapting to this rise when compared to the ports and the tributaries I represent in some of our, in our area, in some of our district, Ports would actually benefit from increased uh, water levels. So I guess my question to each of the witnesses is, how could a more localized approach to mitigation help protect our economy and better prepare individual communities? Should there be a federal role in helping communities prepare and address these issues? And if so, what is it? How can we better address local communities? Should there be a federal role in doing this? And if so, what is it? Dr. Cooley, I'll start with you. Well, I think we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that effects of climate change are regionally variable. And so there's no one size fits all solution. As you noted, um, your region is gonna have a different set of needs than uh, Congressman Posey's district. Um, there are best practices, however, that emerge from handling a particular issue, adapting to a particular issue, uh, a type of issue, for example. Um, uh, for example, we've learned quite a lot from the example of the shellfish growers in the Pacific Northwest. Those growers are now sharing their knowledge with growers in Maine, on the Gulf Coast, so that uh, American aquaculture can thrive and grow with the benefit of foresight. So I think that's one thing the federal government can absolutely facilitate. Thank you for the short answer. Dr. Horton, you got a hard act to follow. Yeah, I, I think a blend of, of scales, as we heard. Each community is going to have um, unique solutions, but similarly, um, some solutions are going to need to operate at scales far beyond what a local community um, could afford. So I think we do need um, consistent policies in that regard. We also just more practically need to make sure that different adaptation strategies across, say, different agencies or different communities aren't operating at cross purposes, right? The sort of superficial example would be if one community you know, builds a seawall, does that increase the flooding for the nearby community? That's sort of an oversimplified example, but I think it's, it's, it's emblematic of, of why we need coordination. And Let's jump control. to Dr. Fraser. He seems to be the fishing expert, except for his one faux pas of exploit. And, and that would be, the oystering is huge in my district. So CO2, le CO2 levels, and I read some of the testimony on the Japanese oysters that were brought over and, and how they've suffered some setbacks and stuff. So Dr. Frazier, for you, for my Gulf Coast district in Texas, what needs to be specifically aimed at the Gulf Coast there? So um, I'm, I'm gonna say that the federal government could invest in the science that's going to allow us to take some of these global scale models and be able to downscale them so that we can make predictions about specific regional areas like yours. 
um, those predictions would allow us perhaps to develop the, the uh, infrastructure that we need to deal with increased flooding, for example, or other storm-related uh, events. Uh, is it Polaro, is that how you say that? Uh, I'm a little over time, but you've got 30 seconds with the indulgence of the chair. Thank you. Without objection. Well, Texas oysters are great. We'd like to have them around for a long time because I think it, with anything, diversity in the market is wonderful. And you can stop right there. You know. I, I think <laughs> I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. No, go ahead and say the rest of what you were going to say. I think that, the, as Dr. Cooley said, some of the lessons learned from um, how, uh, how shellfish are responding to these changes in the Northwest is applicable to what, what you might be seeing in, in, in Texas. And as, as people are seeing something that's different than what they've experienced, they should be encouraged to ask more questions to a broader audience because um, it might be just the variability of something localized or it might be something grander with some um, oceanographic uh, element that's happening. So um, I think it's really important to um, look carefully and ask lots of questions about what might be happening there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Weber. I will now recognize Mr. Posey for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to uh, thank the ranking member and the chair for inviting me to participate here today. Uh, I live upon the Atlantic shores of the Florida Peninsula. Uh, my constituents understand in a very deep way uh, the economic and environmental importance of our oceans. Uh, we also have an estuary. It's uh, uh, one of those special places, as you all know, where the rivers uh, meet the seas. And uh, ours is named the Indian River Lagoon and it has been identified as the most diverse estuary uh, in the country. Uh, this is one of the important reasons that uh, I co-founded the Congressional Estuary Caucus with Chairwoman Bonamici, and we have rechartered a caucus again for this uh, session. I also um, want to thank uh, the panel, obviously, for showing up and, and say a special hello to Dr. Frazier from uh, our University of Florida. Uh, in addition, uh, I want to acknowledge the work of the Florida Institute of Technology on the ocean and estuary issues. And I have received a statement from Dr. Uh, Robert Weaver, Director of Indian River Lagoon Research at FIT, on matters we're discussing today. And I ask unanimous consent to have that entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Um, I'm also proud to be a co-sponsor of the National Estuary Acidification Research Act. Uh, the bill has the objective of focusing acidification research on the impacts of our estuaries as, as well. Um, also pleased to be a co-sponsor of the Coastal and Ocean Acidification Stressors and Threats Research Act, and y'all are familiar with that as well. I won't, I won't describe that for the record. Uh, I just uh, make those points leading up uh, to the uh, questions that are very vital to all of us in this committee and, and every one, single one of my constituents, and, and that is how we solve the problems that we have. And, you know, first and foremost, we talk about our estuary, and, and I've always said that the, the answer is very simple. It's two steps. One, stop putting bad stuff in it, and two, start removing the bad stuff that's already there. Now, a lot of people are offended by that, but that's the top line. Uh, it only gets confusing when you start delving into the details of how to do that. There's so many different options to do it, and it's one of those cases where it seems everybody in the room knows how to make a baby stop crying, except the person holding it. And uh, it's very hard to get a consensus on, on the order and the, the way to do it. There's so many variable solutions. I, you know, I'm guessing there's over 100. We could probably list 100 different solutions. And, and I, I just wonder if there's ever been any research um, that, that would uh, quantify all the different potential solutions uh, for, for cleaning it up and, and you know, the cost roughly uh, per the benefit the amount of uh, clean water in each of those. If any of you are aware of, of any research on that or a source, uh, I, I would really like to have or, or your comments on it, generally speaking. 
I start, Dr. Coley. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your leadership on the NEAR Act as well. Um, that is that that solutions uh, or assessment of the solutions that we have is critically needed. Um, I, having been participating in the National Climate Assessment, I'm a big believer in the um, process of scientific assessment where all of the information is gathered and assessed as one to look at risks and, and likelihoods. Um, we have much fewer uh, research studies looking at the impacts of solutions, partly because they take a long time to apply yeah. and then even longer to measure how, yeah. how well they're doing. But I think that is a key knowledge gap that this committee can turn to um, and begin to address. Doctor. Very quickly, I'd, I'd second that. Evaluating adaptation strategies, but all in the context of a changing climate, um, but also the nuts and bolts of implementation, right? Working with the existing agencies, the existing funding cycles, bringing all that together um, uh, to, to come up with solutions that work for all. Okay. Dr. Frazier. Thank you. Um, I would agree with you. The problem's complex, right? And there's certainly lots of issues that we have to consider simultaneously. With regard to the issue in, in your own backyard, um, I would point you to the TMDL process and what that is, is the total maximum daily loads. And that incorporates input from all of the stakeholders and people that might be involved in a way to identify what are the sources of pollutants into the estuary, and how can they collectively reduce those um, inputs? I agree. We need to be working towards solution, and in the process of doing that, we need to really keep this communication and collaboration open and engaged and robust. Um, we've learned quite a bit um, uh, from, from our experience on the, in the Northwest. Um, we have uh, the valuable information exchange, and one of the things that I think is most important that has happened and most exciting is that we've got non-scientists thinking about science, and we've got non-farmers thinking about farming, yeah. and that there is got a wonderful opportunity for all of us. Well, I, I, another moment. Uh, you know, if, sure. if, if somewhere there could just be, just say given a certain level of pollution, you know, were certain measurements that you've taken. And, and here is a list of every single thing from oyster beds to oxygenating to on down the list. And then, you know, here's the cost of cleaning up 10 gallons of that water with this method and that method, just as a baseline so that, you know, there's, there's just not such a food fight over evaluating the different methods that somewhere there's a legitimate uh, method of determining in, in economic return or priority uh, which of these is most effective. So anyway, I hope somebody will start that research sometime. I'd be glad to help you pursue it and, and beat on doors and raise money or whatever it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Posey. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll now recognize Mr. Beyer for five minutes. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Um, let me just begin that since entering Congress, I've been working with Senator Sheldon the White House from Rhode Island on building up our ocean resilience uh, capacity, following my dear friend, Congresswoman Susan Bonamici, who's been leading ocean acidification for years and years, um, that you're the concern about it. And we've been working both through the regional coastal resilience grants and with the National Ocean and Coastal Security Fund, which have now been combined into the National Coastal Resilience Fund. It's obvious with climate change, we need much more resilient communities with increasing storms, increased incessant flooding, worsened by continued sea level rise. I think Northrop Grumman has a chart that shows that Norfolk and Portsmouth, Virginia will be underwater 50% of the year um, by 2050. And this means ensuring that our fisheries are healthy, that we're adapting as those fisheries adapt to changing ocean conditions, and it certainly means taking advantage of the offshore wind potentials, which Virginia is moving forward on right now. Dr. Cooley, the Washington Post recently reported that the White House is planning to create its own panel to, quote, reassess the government's analysis of climate science and counter conclusions that the continued burning of fossil fuels is harming the planet. Apparently, the president had not read the, the fourth national climate assessment before it came out. And with Dr. Horton, you were contributing as authors of previous national climate assessments. How much concern do you have that Dr. Professor William Happer is going to lead this? one of the very few scientists who believes that most of the warming is due to national 
causes, natural causes, that he disagrees with the scientific consensus, that he wrote a paper called In Defense of CO2, uh, that it's a boon to planet life. Well, what's interesting about the Na National Climate Assessment is that it qualifies as a federally defined, highly influential scientific assessment. And so as such, it is uh, required to go through a thorough review process, and it needs to meet the standards of the Information Quality Act. Um, these rules have been in place for nearly 20 years to ensure scientific accuracy. And so really, review and assessment, review of this assessment has been baked in all throughout its creation. There were stakeholder engagement conversations, there were expert reviewers at every step, there was federal agencies reviewing this report. And so really any, any uh, reassessment of this report with a small panel is bound to be, be narrower than what it's been through already. And um, you know, I think it's just, it's not gonna be as transparent um, because we know that process is not subject to the same uh, reporting rules that the NCA has already been subject to. Thank you very much. Dr. Horton, in Dr. Cooley's testimony, she wrote um, something I had not really focused on before, that the oxygen loss from the ocean will affect the global nitrogen cycle, and that since nitrous oxide production is actually a worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, a lot of the predictions we've been making, we, we're, we're underestimating. And this ties in with your comment about tipping points about something that James Hansen has warned us about for years and years at, at NASA. Um, can you talk about what some of the surprises are? And I say this having just come back from the Northern Triangle, of Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, where they say one of the big reasons why they're moving from Guatemala to our southern border is because of the extreme drought, the extreme heat, and climate change. One of those surprises. Absolutely right. I think there are really three types of surprises. There's climate change happening faster than we thought, right? So a greater sensitivity the, than to greenhouse gases than we thought. Then there's society being more vulnerable to a given amount of, of warming than we thought, which, which you just alluded to. And then hopefully maybe some potential for surprises where we as a society move quickly to, to deal uh, with this problem. In terms of physical hazards, some of the tipping points um, that are getting so much attention, marine ice cliff instability, this idea that Perhaps paradoxically, as you move inland um, in parts of Antarctica, the land actually slopes downward due to the incredible weight of all that accumulated ice. If you start that process um, of water beginning to make its way down due to warming and melting, over long time scales, it can be a runaway. That's one uh, tipping point. Arctic sea ice, we've lost more than 50% of the volume of late summer sea ice in the last 35 years or so. Another possible tipping point. There's a feedback there, right, where you remove that white surface, dark surface that absorbs more sunlight, causes more warming. Those are just a couple of them that, that we worry about. But I, I like how you highlighted this sort of impact side, too. You know, what if we're underestimating how sensitive our crops might be to real extreme temperatures, our vulnerable populations to combinations of heat and humidity, the potential for conflict around the world yeah. as sea levels rise? Could we lose control of this narrative, the ability to even deal with the problem in a, in a collective way? That's another risk the further we push the system, I think. There are also these, these possibility for tipping points on the solution side, too. I think you know we, we, we have to keep hope because we can't rule out the extent to which, for example, young people may really sort of rise up and demand um, that their institutions address these hazards. When they pick the companies they want to work for, ultimately the businesses they want to invest their money in, they may be looking to see which companies are disclosing their vulnerability to the risks and the extent to which they're contributing to some of these problems, too. Great. Thank you very much. Matt and Matera, you'll back. Thank you, Mr. Beyer. And before we bring the hearing to a close, I want to thank all of my colleagues uh, for their questions, their thoughtful questions, and especially um, Ranking Member Marshall for his um, opening the hearing with our shared value that we all want to leave uh, the world better than we found it. And I think we all agree on that, and we have a lot of work ahead of us. So I appreciate the witnesses coming today uh, to testify before the committee and also for submitting the written testimony. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions um, the committee may ask of the witnesses. So I thank you all for your time here today, um, for your valuable contributions, and look forward to working with the entire committee and with you as we move forward. The witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned.